see so many uh, participants on uh, sunday morning uh, so we are in lockdown last day of lockdown 3.0 and mumbai in pune i am sure we are going in lockdown 4.0 so uh, it's a very tricky situation and uh, but uh, i am I'm sure the learning should not be stopped, and that is the motto of uh, the webinar. And uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to have all our uh, MSCS uh, president and secretary, uh, Dr. Ashish Kare, and our and our panelists, which I'm formally going to introduce after some time. Uh, the topic is very much interesting: ovarian ovarian stimulation for IUI basic and practical approach. And I'm sure all our participants are uh, going to be enriched uh, after. The discussion by the panelists. So, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, the NOGS president. Uh, it's a pleasure, sir, Dr. Shekhar Amle. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to have you here, sir. Uh, I am handing over the session to you so that you can formally introduce to our speaker. Thank you, sir, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Guruna, sir. The basic idea be behind this NOGS Katta is getting clarified day by day. Katta is something we come and we discuss, not officially, we discuss in a friendly manner. When we can ask, whatever we can ask to our friends, we cannot ask to other teachers and this thing so friendly. So the platform, NOGS Katta, is meant for that. So I appeal all of uh, my NOGS members to feel free to ask anything, any doubt they are having. That is the basic concept behind this NOGS Katta. Uh, whether it may be a, a kavi mela or it will be a coffee with the, on uh, katta, these are the programs we will be taking in coming uh, lockdown period or it will be continued afterwards also. So coming to today's topic, we were thinking there are so many webinars going on all over the world in the molecular basis and everything, everything, but we are losing something basic. So I thought, why not to take a topic, ovarian stimulation, which everybody, every gynecologist is doing in his clinic. And basic of that and practical approach. So thinking in that, uh, who will be speaking best uh, practically and basically, basic things about ovarian stimulation. Then the name came in front of me was Ashish. I have uh, attended his lecturer lectures through his uh, Facebook group. Uh, directly on Zoom meetings is fantastic in explanation. He is a very good teacher. He is holding so many posts. He is holding uh, so many posts in ISAR, uh, ISAR then um, Maharashtra State Chapter also, and IAG also. Uh, being uh, representing India at uh, national and international levels also, but whenever you meet him, any conference or wherever you meet him, is very humble and is very friendly. You will never feel anything, any hitch to ask him any doubt. So we have chosen him, uh, and we have chosen the esteemed panelists also from our Nasik Society, uh, Dr. Samir Pawar, Dr. Jogesh Pachao, Dr. Sanjay Kadam, Dr. Yashwant Mane, Dr. Ranjit Doshi, and uh, a super lady of our NOGS, uh, Nalini Bagul Madam. I will not take much time. I'll, uh, ask, I'll uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ashish Kare to start his uh, uh, speech, uh, today's speech. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah. Uh, at the outset, I really thankful to my old friend, Dr. Shekhar Amle, and all of you, those who are panelists. I know you, every one of you, very personally on my personal uh, uh, connections with uh, Nashik. And it's not uh, something different. I am feeling like I'm talking to my friends. And rightly said, uh, Shekhar, it is a two-way interaction. So any doubts, you can ask me. I'm not saying myself will be a very expert in the field, but whatever I can do, I can make a justice to make it as far as the ovulation induction is considered. So I'm really thankful to you uh, to take my name and consider my name for this topic. So to start with, I, I will go to the my slide. Uh, I think uh, all of you can see my uh, screen now. Is it a, yes. a screen? Yeah. Okay. So today uh, we'll be talking about something is a is a day to day practice, and I'll be just talking like this as uh, all of us as a gynecologist or those who are doing a fellowship in reproductive medicine, 
or for those people who are just doing their ms residency so from the basic we'll go to the advanced how the stimulation protocol should be done so today we'll be uh, talking about just this is related to the iui i'm not going to talk about something related to the ivf or maybe a um, poor ovarian reserve because that is a, a not in our uh, topic today so why we should need a stimulation the reasons might be we need a good quality of the oocyte we need uh, in getting us a uh, good number of uh, oocytes which is required for the fertilization to occur because in iui we don't want to see what is the quality of the oocyte we never know what is is, a, is there is a fertilization is going to get occur or not so it is our uh, um, as a clinician point of view we uh, might think that we sh after the stimulation we will get a one or two or three good quality of the oocyte there is a, a certain correlations between when you're talking about stimulation protocols so certain uh, endogenous hormones which will play in middle and that will getting going to get corrected when you started the patient with the ovulation induction so these are are certain uh, endo, um, endocrine abnormalities or hormonal dysfunctions can be corrected as all of us are knowing the ovulatory disorders is is account to the tune of 25% as far as the infertility is considered when you uh, the patient of infertility coming down to you as a general gynecologist we know that the 50% will related to the female infertility and 50% may correlate to the male infertility so in 50% of a female infertility the major cause of um, uh, of a infertility cause is an ovulation or maybe ovulatory dysfunction so coming down to what is the effect of it might get a, a discordant go if you start stimulation which your drug you uh, will go and you give it will cause a discordant growth we don't want a discordant growth to occur suppose uh, if you have started the patient on day 5 and day 6 already the uh, oocyte is going to get retrieval and then you will start with the clomiphene site you see that there is a discordant growth and this the discordant growth will not lead to the pregnancy rates the effect on the endometrium and implantation all of us are knowing i'll be going and talking uh, on this particular aspect in a in a minute or so so whenever you are doing some giving some drug for that matter any oral ovulation may have the imp impact on the endometrium as well as the implantation so we must know about it so uh, broadly when the patient coming down to you you have to uh, have a uh, two groups of the patient the where when you take the history the when the female patient come down to you you just take the history of uh, how is her menstrual cycle whether it is regular or whether it is irregular whether it is a decrease in a flow or not so this will uh, account for your things like whether it is a an ovulatory do uh, like a uh, ovarian dysfunctions or maybe it is a unexplained unexplained usually the patient has a regular menstrual cycle there is no obvious cause which has been documented and in an ovulatory according to the who we have the groups like hypogonadotropic hypogonadism if we uh, done a day to uh, hormones for those patients will found out that there is a decrease in fsh and a basal estradiol we have a normo estrogenic normo gonadotropic patients where the fsh lh is normal but in certain sub group of the patient like a pcos you will see that there is increase in lh and the third group is a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism there where there is an ovulation because of there is a increase in fsh and this fsh if you go into the detail of the patient and if you do a amh levels the amh levels will be less so we uh, group this patient as a patient of a diminished ovarian reserve and the fourth one is a because of the hyperprolactinemia there may be an ovulation so if you done a day two scan and in day two scan everything is normal if you just just do a tsh and the prolactin if the prolactin is on a higher side you will know this is one of the cause of an ovulation and if you correct the hyperprolactin i will not go into the details of hyperprolactinemia and the treatment of it but you correct the hyperprolactinemia the ovulation get returns then subset of the group is remain that is called as unexplained uh, uh, patients where you uh, get the patients as having the history of regular menstruation there is no obvious cause but still they they are are the patients not going to conceive spontaneously so in those patients we called as unexplained uh, ovarian disorders or unexplained infertility usually this can be corrected in a different i will go, go to the stimulation protocols for those patients also so coming down to the what is the incidence of all these things the incidence is 40% is a pcos 
30 to 50 percent is ovulatory patients and uh, ovulatory means those come into the unexplained infertility patients one to two percent where we get a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and one to three percent comes into a type three or a group three who patients before going into the details of uh, ovarian stimulation for any uh, one it is basically we should know uh, a basic things of ovulation how it occurs and what it matters to us we know the, uh, there is called as a two cell two gonadotropin theory we know there is a cell is called as granulosa cells which is predominantly fsh receptors are there and this fsh is responsible for a receptors are responsible for the recruitment of the follicle and then the second cell is a thicker cell where they have the lh receptors and this lh receptors is responsible for the maturation of the follicle as well as the growth of in a uh, in a late follicular phase so in a early follicular phase we want the pa patients to be having a good amount of the fsh receptors and mind well if the fsh receptors is good and functioning we have a better pool of the oocyte which is going to get recruited and in second half of the follicular phase we know all of us are know that there is a lh receptors which is there for the maturity of the of the follicles and the growth of the follicles and this is something like what i was talking about we have the certain pool of the uh, of the follicles that is called as antral follicles these antral follicles are are going to have fsh receptors then there is a called as a recruitment of the follicles and after the recruitment then there is a follicular dominance and then the follicular after the follicular dominance we have the phase of ovulation so all, all of us are, are why we need to know this uh, important concept of the follicular genesis is that there is called as fsh threshold then there is called as fsh window the fsh window when you have a window which is smaller only cat can come in if the window is open wider even if the dog and the bigger animal can come in the similar way if your fsh window is bigger one the you are going to have more follicle which is going to get recruited and if your threshold is been reached those are follicles which is been recruited has all of the potential to have a formation of unifollicular or a uniform growth of these follicles and after this uniform growth of the follicles we have there is called as a lh window the lh uh, is ceiling effect if that is not there then we have a premature lh or may we have a uh, not a good follicles which is going into the ovulation so hope till now i am clear with the basic concept of ovulation induction and the basic concept how the ovulation uh, induction should be taken into account after this uh, these are the things what i was talking about we have there is called as fsh fsh threshold after the fsh threshold is been achieved we know this follicle is going to get re, uh, recruited and going to have a, a uniform growth uh, if the threshold is not been maintained then there is called as atresia or there may be a, a, a follicle which is not going to show the growth of it so uh, whenever you are going to do certain um, uh, stimulation protocols for for that matter iui for that matter ivf what must uh, important factors what we are thinking into our mind is the first is the age of the patient see uh, whenever you are coming down to the iui patient and the patient age is more than 40 it is a better you should assess the patient in order to have what is her age what is her afc what is her amh so if the amh and afc is low it is not advisable that you can go with the with the three cycles of iui it is better that we should give a one cycle if the patient is 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 uh, is not going for the ivf you must try a one cycle of coh iui but if that fails it is your duty to talk to the patient what is the reality what is the oocyte retrieval rate in those patients where the amh is uh, is low and the age is high okay so uh, if you know what is the amh levels i will not go into the details of it there is called as normal range there is a higher responders and there is a poor response then coming down to the oral ovulation the case of yeah uh, pertaining to the, the i am i am taking all this thing pertaining to the relation to that of the iui the iui where we can use is a clomiphenicitate the clomiphenicitate is not something new drug it uh, it comes into a, a market in 1956 the first clinical trial has been done in 1960 all of us should know what is the important thing is the elimination rate of the clomiphenicitate 
Chlorophyll saturate is here. 85 percent is eliminated in the from the body by one week. But mind well, uh, like many of the patients, they take the treatment from you. They take a pause of a one month and they come with a pregnancy test positive. That is not something miracle which is going to happen. That is because of the residual effect of the chlorophyll saturate. And so that in the next month also, the patient has the folliculogenesis and she become pregnant. By it is not a spontaneous pregnancy; it's a residual effect of the chlorophyll saturate. The increment dose, all of us are known that if the patient is obese, we require increment doses of the chlorophyll saturate. It can be uh, started with the 50 milligram, and then it can go to the tune of the 200. But after 150, we call as a chlorophyll resistance. The ovulation rate. Is 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 a lower. We, if you are, if the you consider the patient is a normal gonadotropic, uh, normal hormonal patients, it is advisable that you should start with a low dose. It is not always better to go with the higher dose of chlorophyll saturate because ovulation rate is much more better when you start with the lower dose in the normal gonadotropic patients. So ovulation rate is 52 percent, and it occurs. Uh, when if you really don't want, if there are the certain gynecologists who practice in a in a periphery of of our uh, country, where the even if the sonography is not available, then it is mind well you can start the chlorophyll uh, saturate and thinking that on day uh, five or day twelve after the last dose the ovulation will occur. This is indirect evidence, but it is uh, it is always ad advisable that you should do a follicular study when you are giving a chlorophyll saturate. The chlorophyll saturate. I will not go into the details of it. All of us are knowing it. The pregnancy rate is 40 percent, and this how uh, we can how many cycles we can go. We will go in with the 50 milligram. Then, if there is no ovulation, we can increase to 100 milligram of a chlorophyll saturate. If it is not, then we can go with the 150 milligram. But mind well, when you are skipping uh, uh, from 50 milligram to 150 milligram, you must know what is the previous response of a dose to the Uh, by the patient so there is called as a chlorophyll failure and chlorophyll resistance chlorophyll failure is 50 to 60% the failure to conceive that means that whenever uh, you are giving a chlorophyll saturate and patient is not going to conceive in a 3 months of ovulation has been documented and she is not conceived we call as a chlorophyll failures and the chlorophyll resistance is a one where there is no uh, ovulation which is going to occur after the dose of 150 mg the ovulation rate is a 70 to 80% the pregnancy rate is 50% if you thinking of the cumulative pregnancy rate what i mean by the cumulative pregnancy rate if you given the chlorophyll saturate for 6 months if there is a uh, chances that in one or two months even if she is ovulated she is not having the pregnancy but after the 3 or 4 months of the cycle she will have and going to achieve the pregnancy so that the cumulative pregnancy rate for 6 months is a to the tune of 70 to 75% But mind well, the chlorophyll saturate causes multifollicular development. So we have a multifetal pregnancy to the tune of seventy seven to ten percent. The insulin resistance. We know. I am going to come down to the case presentation. Then we will discuss more about it. What is insulin resistance and how it has been uh, taken care of? So insulin resistance usually occurs in normal gonadotropic, normal uh, uh, estrogenic patients, where we call as a, uh, like a PCOS patient. in a pco patient usually they account for the hyperinsulinemia and that's why uh, there has to have some addition of the drugs that has to be taken into account i will not go into this particular things then we come down to the aromatase inhibitor if the patient is not showing the good response with the clomiphene saturate what is the another drug what we can use as far as the ovulation induction is considered in iui is aromatase inhibitor that all of us are using is a letro letrozole the letrozole can be used with a dose of 2.5 to 5 mg but mind well you should be using a letrozole with the minimal dose of 2.5 because in a certain patients only the higher dose is required a majority of the patients they are uh, uh, done very well with the 2.5 the study shows that the pregnancy rate with aromatase inhibitor are similar to the clomiphene saturate but it is better in a pcos because when you are uh, giving the letrozole the letrozole doesn't have anti estrogenic effect on the endometrium and on the uh, like anti estrogenic effect on the cervical mucus so we have the beautiful endometrium after when we are giving a letrozole the letrozole has been used for multifollicular development also and for a, a monofollicular development if you wish to go for a monofollicular development 
it is a better that you can give a um, letrozole 2.5 mg for 5 days it can be started from day 2 or day 3 or at uh, a later stage you can start as late as a uh, day 5 but mind well when you are starting a 2.5 mg per day you will land up into a monofollicular development if you wish to go for a multifollicular development we have extended protocol or we have a step up protocol for a letrozole where the FSH window will be increased. Once you increase the FSH window, you will have the FSH threshold is also increased. So you will have more recruit, recruitment of the follicles. And so that in a, a letrozole group also, uh, we, we can go for a multifollicular development. So this is called as a step up protocol where you can start a one tablet from day two of the menstrual cycle. There, then you can switch over to the two tablets, then three tablets and then four tablets. What will happen in this step of protocol is that we will increase the FSH threshold, we'll increase the FSH window, so more the follicles is going to get recruited, and once the follicle size will reach to the 18 to 20 millimeters, then you can give a, a rupturing or the trigger. For that matter, any trigger will, will be a suffice. I will not go into the details of the trigger here. The points to know is that extends the FSH window, what I talked about. It prevents the rising of the estrogen from suppressing the endogenous FSH. It, it, uh, it controls the breakthrough estrogen production due to a, a proliferation of the granulosa cells. If the granulosa cells is proliferated, we don't have the uh, like estrogen to come up in the middle. And that's why we have the uniform development of the follicles and the multifollicular are, uh, things are can be achieved. The higher pregnancy rates automatically going to get achieved uh, if you go through the Ishray uh, uh, guidelines or for that matter um, ASRN guidelines. The letrozole now a drug of choice as far as the PCOS patient is considered because in those patients this letrozole will not have the anti-estrogenic effect on the endometrium and has the better pregnancy rates. So letrozole in clomiphene resistance definitely when the patient is not going to have the ovulation with the letrozole of 150 milligram. The letrozole is a drug of choice. You can put the patient on the letrozole, see how she is behaving with the letrozole, and then you can have a good response with the letrozole in certain patients. There is called as a letrozole extended protocol where you can give the letrozole 2.5 milligram instead of five days. You can prolong it for the 10 days so that you can have, usually this protocol, uh, I will be advocating for the CC resistance patient. So those are the patients where there is a clofin resistance. You can definitely use this protocol for, for ovulation stimulation uh, to be uh, done. Then gonadotropins. In which patients you can use the gonadotropins? Definitely gonadotropins can be used in a, in a CC resistance or maybe a CC failure or group one of a WHO when there is annulatory disorders where you are thinking that there is a hypothalamic uh, cause or hypothalamic pituitary insufficiency where you can use the gonadotropins I will not go into the details of because we are in a panel, we are going to discuss which is the better drug, where I can use a HMG or can I use a recombinant FSH, what is the ideal dose. But mind well, just to give you the brief about things, in our practice, in Indian scenario, it is better to use a, a HMG with the 102, uh, 112, that is 112 international units to start with. Usually we uh, go with the step down protocol instead of a step up protocol because uh, i want a multifollicular development so i will i'll be going hitting the patient hard that means a higher dose will be giving initially after that i will reduce down the um, dose according to the response of the follicles so these are the certain things like what the dose ideal dose it can be it will be depending if i don't have the amh facility with me then it is better to do a day two scan the day two scan will tell me what is the antral follicular count if it is a normal ovary, which means that if you do a scan, I advised all the gynecologists fellow of mine and colleague of mine, please do a sonography by yourself. Now it is our era that we should be doing a follicular study by ourselves. We are the masters in vaginal surgeries. We are the masters in our armamentarium. So it is always better to do a, a transvaginal scan by ourselves rather than by the radiologist or by other fellows. So if you do a day two scan, you will be knowing that what enteral follicles you are dealing with, what ideal dose you can be advocated with. So these are the uh, things are like, uh, I'll not go a mega set trial. 
But usually uh, the take home message of a mega set HR trial that both recombinant FSH and HMG both are are equivalent as far as the IUI is uh, and uh, the IVF is is going uh, is a question to talk about. I think it is better that you should give the drug which is comfortable for your patient. It is comfortable for the economy of the patient. The HMG and FSH both are gives the better results. There is nothing like a superiority and inferiority. Nowadays, we come up with the HMG, which can be given as the multi-dose, which can be also titrated doses in a liquid preparations also. So this is a mega set trial, which will uh, compare head to head um, uh, things, uh, what actually to be done. Uh, so I'll not go into the details because that will be something I'll be talking about uh, as far as the panel discussion is considered. The mega set trial uh, usually uh, gives uh, uh, upper hand that when you are using HMG, HMG can be used as one of the uh, gonadotropins, uh, if at all you wanted to use the gonadotropins in the patients. So these are the protocols what we advocated. We, we started with the starting dose, like this is a step up protocol. And there is something called as a step down protocol. And then there is called as a, step, uh, like a continuous protocol, low dose continuous. But mind well, in an Indian scenario, a chronic low dose protocol where you can give a 37.5 for 14 days. Mind well, the patient compliance is not that great. So when you're talking about patient compliance, I think it is better to do a step up or step down protocol after seven days. Uh, if you give the gonadotropins for continuously for seven days, call the patient on day seven, do the scan, and then you decide whether you go a step up or step down protocol because extended chronic low dose protocol for 14 days might be a, some patient is not that much compliance of the patient is not good. So the dropout rates are, are more when you're talking about a continuous low dose uh, uh, protocol. So this is a, what I was talking about, continuous low dose uh, chronic protocol, where you can give a 37.5 or, or 75 international units. Then you increase the dose by 50%. And then again, for, uh, for maybe a seven days, then do a call, take a call. And this usually this is good for the PCOS patient, but this is not good for a normal, normal estrogenic, normal gonadotropic patients. So uh, to start what we do in our practice, I think uh, the panelists also will be going to get agree on this. We start with the higher dose, then we uh, call up the patient after seven days. If the follicle size is good, we reduce it down to 37.5. If the on day eight scan, we uh, scan the patient continuously. Once the follicle has become a dominant follicle of 18 to 19, we give a trigger. So there are the different protocols, different protocols. I'll be talking that and we'll be discussing this in the, on a, our katta with the panelists because there are also esteemed panelists here. Uh, so I'll be talking uh, with them. It's just a, a formal discussion about how uh, we should be adding a close sighted with gonadotropin whether you can give clonal set uh, you will be doing uh, addition of a uh, gonadotropin from day 9 or day 11 when you are started there is called as a pn chakravarti protocol where they they give the gonadotropin along with the clonal citrate on day 3 and day 7 what is the ideal of of giving a uh, day 3 gonadotropin like whenever you are giving the gonadotropin along with the clonal citrate on day 3 which will gives the boost up to the follicles to form and day seven will uh, will or day eight will be uh, giving a gonadotropins because uh, from uh, his point of view that will be sustained uh, release or sustained threshold will be achieved. There is another protocol like a pre-treatment or pre-luteal uh, dose of clomiphene citrate. This is something new where you can give. Uh, this is usually been given in a polycystic patients where PCOS patients come down to you. You give a non-ethysterol for a withdrawal. And the, the last dose of a non ethysterol you will start giving a clofen set rate of 100 milligram per day. Thinking that when she has the vitriol bleeding, your dose of clofen set rate will be uh, done and she will have anti estrogenic of the clofen set rate, will not act on the endometrium. So, we'll have the beautiful endometrium which has been, been uh, formed and the uh, anti estrogenic effect of the clofen set rate will not be there. That is the one of the thinking process of giving. Of clomiphene citrate in a luteal phase. And secondly, 
is that you have the cohort of the follicle which has already been developed so this can be uh, one of the uh, what we call as a uh, stimulation protocols as far as the uh, gonadotropin is considered then coming down to the uh, to the lh premature lh whether you should be adding antagonist because nowadays if anyone talk about antagonist he will become a hero so it is nothing like that mind well you need to understand the patient history you need to understand whether you are started the patient on on clomiphen started for that matter you add the gonadotropins and she on a day 9 or day 10 you done the scan and the follicle is not seen or there is no response that means these are the patients where the ls surge is already been occurred there are subset of the patient where you can you definitely add antagonist and single dose or maybe in iui if you thinking a uh, addition of the gonadotropins and addition of the antagonist a one or two dose will suffice your uh, stimulation protocol so it is not advocated that you should give a uh, routine dose of gonadotropins these are the certain uh, things what we can do i already talked with it so we'll be discussing in a panel again about this uh, protocol what actually antagonists to be added and which dose it should be added i think uh, there is no role of giving a single dose antagonist of 3 mg you can just instead of uh, sticking to the ivf protocol of antagonists like whenever the follicle is 14 mm you start giving a uh, antago uh, addition of the antagonist it is better that you can uh, little bit wait for iui cycles once the follicle is 15 mm you can start giving uh, antagonist or addition of the antagonist so these are the certain things review of literature uh, so uh, what protocols is the addition of gonadotropins is helpful whether we should go iui to the ivf i will be asking this to my august uh, uh, people here those are uh, are with me so there is something like unexplained infertility see that now uh, the time is come like from the conferences we uh, i am meeting all of you virtually on uh, webinar and all the things those who are uh, delegates or those who are my friends i in that 200 participants there uh, it is uh, different that i am i am missing that gathering but it is always a uh, better that safe distancing now a uh, key similarly uh, if you go in the details of unexplained infertility this is the literature with come in the uh, march 2020 like one month back till now we thought that coh iui for unexplained infertility is the key no it is wrong now the concept is that uh, all of the cochran reviews and all of this fertility fertility journal when you are thinking that if the patient is of unexplained infertility better to give a clofen citrate and if she is not conceived then it is better to put forward that patient for uh, ivf we don't know what is the cause of infertility in those patients so unnecessarily giving the gonadotropins and doing the iui will not suffice they have this particular uh, paper with them where they calculated that there is no point in addition of the gonadotropins in unexplained infertility you wanted to do iui in those patients start with the with the clofen citrate start with the extended protocol of a letrozole do iui if that doesn't work there is something there may be a, a what you call as follicles or oocyte which is not of not of good quality there is something that we are missing up so in unexplained infertility there is a no of using a coh iui as far as this particular cochrane or this thing is considered so what we uh, come up now we have anti estrogenic to add with we have letrozole we have clofen citrate we have gonadotropins we have gnh uh, antag to add on we have all these things in our environmentarium so i'll just uh, now go to the panel i will go to the president dr shekhar to take a call uh, like what all you know, to be used in which patient it has to be used and and i really request all of you please judiciously use your judgmental things it is not like uh, someone is a president of so and so started using so all of us will use a gonadotropin something is not like that so individualize your uh, protocol the patients are different all of us are different our looks are different so stimulation protocols will be different so i will ask uh, dr uh, shekhar amle to take a call uh thank you ashish wonderful 100% perfect this was a very very nice crisp lecture from you i will not say lecture it was an experience what you have facing day to day 
it was very basic and very practical thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture yeah. now i open this for panel discussion ashish you can yes. continue with the uh, hitting you are killing you are <laughs> panelists with your questions okay go ahead uh, dr shekhar i am really humble uh, like i see all this panelist is very dear friend of mine and they are really a uh, big names in a uh, fertility and uh, endoscopy is considered including yourself i know a uh, wonderful surgeon you are so it's a it's a just a request like uh, i am just discussing it there is nothing like uh, it's i am a superior and i am a moderator we are friends and and any suggestion from you people is always welcome for me so i'm just uh, uh, sharing my things are uh, what we can do I, in uh, uh, i just uh, give up one thing uh, anyone you wanted to answer just raise a hand because uh, that will gives us a uh, idea that whom to ask this particular uh, questions so i welcome all the panelists i like dr uh, dr nalini bagul dr amit kulkarni dr yashwan mane dr samir and dr sanjay kadam so uh, this is a, just a panel uh, i am not uh, here to give a evidence based because that is already been covered we are just dealing with the practical cases i want a practical guidelines because this is a katta like our president talked about katta should be a one to one interaction like a bj katta maybe a medical katta so there is nothing like a, a i will do this is what are you doing? you will talk about it so without wasting any time uh, i'll just ask uh, this question to all of you a 20 year old patient with a primary infertility come to the clinic she has the history of marriage for 3 years trying to conceive for 2 years because 28 years she is young uh, but she is married uh, for 3 years uh, like now indian uh, families this is uh, coming with the background she wanted to conceive but she is unable to conceive for last 2 years and she has a normal menstruation pattern because as the history as a uh, gynecologist you asked her about the menstrual history she said that everything is normal so um, coming down to the uh, uh, the history of sexual activity she said that is not the problem that is no early ejaculation or something like that with the male partner is considered you done her a routine check up of uh, bmi and all that thing is calculated she is a good uh, having a good fitness of a bmi also so i like you to ask my mm -hmm. panelists uh, what exactly you will be thinking of this patient what investigations or directly you will talk anything you will wish to add something to this history anyone okay male factor has not been evaluated male yeah. factor okay. semen analysis yeah so you may wish to go for a semen analysis or prior to that you will do certain things dr sanjay yeah because she is very young patient 28 year old married 3 years and they are trying since last 2 years only and uh, as you said her basic evaluation has been done like her ovarian reserve is normal her husband's sperm count is normal and she has been not been treated in the last two years i i suppose yes in you uh, after two years she had come down to you so, for the first uh, time yeah. first time is her concern and uh, apart from evaluating her basic uh, parameter like uh, semen analysis and on ultrasound uh, enter follicle count on a day 2 or day 3 if that's normal i would just uh, give as the first in up treatment and do her follicular study in a first, first okay. cycle okay. if a clomipin cycle uh, on a clomipin citrate she is uh, ovulating no, properly we, we will be sticking to the to the first <laughs> evaluation because but that evaluation that okay. I'll ask later on so i will ask dr ranjit any evaluation you wanted to apart from the semen analysis what previous two people talked about they wanted to do a semen analysis of the do also on this uh, couple anything else sir you wanted to do you are you are not audible sir am i audible now yes 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 sir i, I sorry my mic was on mute yes. now whenever we look at any failure of conception we must look at the four fundamental factors of pregnancy yes, or fertility that is sperm eggs uterus and fallopian tubes so through the webinar today is about ovulation induction we may not be getting 
patients of ovulation problem tomorrow. We'll be getting any sort of patient. So we have to go mm -hmm. to the patient and do the semen analysis, like uh, how Nalini Madam has said. We have to check the ovarian reserve. There are different modalities. There are biochemical ones. There are ultrasonic ones. Uh, there are tubal uh, factor, which we can do from imaging techniques like HSG, <laughs> sonography. We don't need to jump to laparoscopy, uh, which is more invasive, expensive, risky, uh, if, unless we have a big problem. We also need to look at the uterus. Uh, so I think once we do these uh, comprehensive analysis on all the four fronts, we get reasonably good idea where the problem is. Okay. So we can plan our, uh, our game plan that which factors need to be treated or corrected whether she needs ovulation or tubal or whatever. Yeah, so I think that's what we should do is go back to the basics, four factors. Any patients coming to you for the first time, we make sure that I, we either have plan for investigating all the four factors simultaneously. And if the investigations have been done once, then we should have analysis of all the four factors, which will take us to the problem. Okay, so to Dr. Samir, we had evaluated her... Uh... Husband's semen analysis has been done. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ranjit said about uh, doing the scan on day two, we had done. So any, any apart from that, you wanted to do something? Since she's, she's married for last year. marriage. She's married for last two years. Uh, yes. For three years. I'm trying for two years. So I'll be uh, evaluating for her thyroid and a prolactin. Okay. Uh, so so, so, so in which range do you think that a preconception thyroid should be uh, there? Because uh, the thyroid reports comes differently. Even if patients get the thyroid reports of 3.5, saying that it is in the normal range. So you wanted to address those patients or you wanted to leave those patients without treatment? PSH should be less than 2.5 if she's planning for a concern. Okay. So any, any, uh, anything I... apart from that you wanted to evaluate her? Because she is a two years of marriage. We had done her semen analysis stating that it is normal. Uh, as Dr. Ranjit uh, said about evaluation on day two scan we done we know her uh, AFC is good she is having a good uh, uterine uh, volume or for that matter the uterine pathology is not there so anything else you wanted to evaluate her apart from PSH and prolactin uh, maybe I will induce ovulation for her for okay. two to three cycles okay. and uh, then uh, go in for a hetero laparoscopy Rather than uh, two cycles, you will be doing uh, her uh, hysterolaparoscopy. Okay. So my question okay. is to Dr. Yeshwan. Hi. Maybe we can do postcoital test for her. And uh, okay, Dr. Sanjay, you wanted to do a postcoital test. Postcoital test, have... and if that is, if there is a survival right. factor, we can straight away uh, advise her uh, intrauterine insemination. Because she has already passed her two years of, of uh, because attempt, uh, and she's 28 year old, attempted uh, pregnancy for last two years. Uh, okay, to Dr. Yeshwant, uh, yeah, to she, she. summarize, uh, like we had done her semen analysis of the patient husband uh, on, on uh, if, uh, like um, her TSH and prolactin has been done. So, uh, will you, do you want, like uh, before evaluating of the tubes, you will uh, go for ovulation induction first? And then she is not conceived. Then you will think of a tubal factor. Yeah, definitely. Like she is uh, less than thirty years. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, basically she is less than thirty years, and they have been trying since last two years. So it would be advisable to go for at least three cycles induction with promethine or letrozole. And if she doesn't conceive in in these three months, then a further step up uh, management in the form of investigations like. A laparoscopy or a HSG, depending upon the patient's affordability and the indication, can be done. Okay, so so my my question is like she is a 28 years old. She <coughs> has not given any history of a PID or pelvic inflammatory disease or something like that, vaginal discharge. So it is uh, like to my all panelists who ever want to answer me, like whether you wanted to evaluate the tubal factor first or whether you start with no, the first. We can start with the ovulation induction for a few cycles, uh, maybe One two cycle. or three cycles. Three cycles should be not more than definitely three cycles. And if she doesn't conceive, then definitely a HSG or a laparoscopy would be recommended. Okay, Dr. Nalini, madam. 
unless there is a history of uh, any pelvic surgery which is which has been done or if it there is a history of tuberculosis then i'll evaluate uh, by uh, hysterosalpingography or uh, uh, laparoscopy if she is having uh, dysmenorrhea severe dysmenorrhea then i would like to go for uh, uh, laparoscopy then in that case so it varies with the different uh, with uh, uh, different histories so you have to take a history of pain in abdomen uh, if previous operations are there if there is history of uh, any uh, uh, tuberculosis then uh, she should undergo the tubal uh, factor uh, so, evaluation so, so dr ranjit uh, like what is your call whether you go her for a sono hysterosalpingography that is it for tubal patency if i am giving you option of three a sono sulfingography maybe a hhg or maybe a laparoscopy because she is 28 years two years of marriage okay. you are uh, all the As factors are normal if all the three factors are normal apart from the tubal and she's been trying for uh, two years so it's better to go for a, at least an hhg if you are good at doing sono sulfingography and if you are confident about it then you do it now one more point which i would like to bring to the stage uh, that any one of these procedures that it may be hsg or sono sulfingography or even laparoscopy for that matter these are all structural assessment of the tube function tell us the functionality however uh, we will get slightly more information with uh, hsg as compared to saline sonography because we have a static picture about the delay uh, to see whether the uh, spill happens on the right side first or the uh, left side first are there any speculations what are the residual volume in the tube so these are so many intricate details we can know even from hsg which we generally don't look at we only look at is there a dye coming out on the other end but there is much more in between that so i i know you're smiling so you can give a webinar on hsg as analysis and i don't mind joining you for that so there is there is a lot more information the simple hsg can give you if you have eyes for it uh, laparoscopy is even more because it is colorful you know whether there is uh, information there are other surrounding structures uh, perihepatic appendicular adhesions colonic adhesions which indicate any current or past inflammatory or infective uh, episode so i think uh, evaluating tubal factor is must uh, in this case but uh, before we start because that not only helps us to reach a diagnosis but also to have a plan suppose there is a delayed spill on one side uh, and then you know you can tell the sir I'll, i'll come down to that Yeah. Uh, because then, then you can uh, explain uh, the patient uh, that there is something something which is not quite right here uh, so we may or may not be having uh, pregnancy uh, because this is a structural test uh, after all now let's look at iui as a as a functional test because what you're doing in iui is essentially Uh, when the ovulation happens that's on, on the fimbrial end you are giving eggs and on the ostia end you are giving sperms so in other words if you look at iui iui is a diagnostic or a challenge to the tubal function you know ki eka bajulo tumhala ande deto eka bajulo sperm deto ata kaam kara and if you if it doesn't work couple of times or three four times then you come to a conclusion yes they are very unlikely or less likely to work second thing is whenever you are suspecting any insert and mainly infective then it's better to diagnose infection as well so uh, i think that will tell us okay let's do a maybe a, a, a some biopsy uh, for tuberculosis or any other infections treat that because that's going to be the primary pathology for the tubal factor that's causing tubal damage uh, and if it is a uh, inflammatory damage then it will reverse uh, and you will have better tubal function uh, after treating the infective cause Uh, as compared to not treating the infected cause yeah okay okay so i wanted to ask uh, dr jogesh mm -hmm. so we we done with the hhg in which mm -hmm. hhg findings you will like to to put the patient for laparoscopy there are certain findings that uh, see the unilateral block we do you want the patient to go for a laparoscopy there are certain delayed spill you want to put the patient for laparoscopy if there is a tio mass you wanted to put the patient for laparoscopy there is a beaded tube you wanted to do a laparoscopy so these are the certain things i wish to uh, indication uh, for laparoscopy yeah after the hsg after see is if say unilateral block 
लेप्रोस्कोपी and uh, asymptomatic mild to moderate endometriosis maybe the patient doesn't give any history can be uh, diagnosed and treated so uh, more of a therapeutic uh, measure treatment for hysteroscopy and laparoscopy okay because we have a good surgeon here again amongst us is uh, dr shekhar where you wanted to do a laparoscopy shekhar here hello am audible yeah, yeah i was yes uh, my mic was mute okay uh, in infertility people you are uh, talking to me <laughs> you are asking me to no, talk because because yes, let's topic i i wanted to talk because there are the two groups everywhere yeah, yeah, yeah. all over yes, the yes. world pro laparoscopy those who do a ivf so or uh, ard procedure <laughs> laparoscopy they come in they chop off everything they do a last <laughs> that's what i mean they don't do a bother for fertility <clears throat> so i wanted to know what is your process yeah. of it basically a laparoscopy is not only a, a treatment part. Uh, you don't do for treatment part it has got a role in diagnosis also there are so many conditions which you don't <coughs> see with a, only sonography or a clinical picture you diagnose on laparoscopy if hg picture is showing a uterine anomaly then hysteroscopy you have to do and laparoscopy also if suppose patient is having some tumor then the nature of the uh, disease whether it is a uh, tuberculosis if it is a abscess if it is say endometriosis you have to do laparoscopy for that patient mm. if uh, in some patients adesiolysis may help you for so many uh, things like uh, it will help you for uh, uh, releasing of the ovaries to be for own pick up mm. or if the tubes are very badly badly affected then you so it is laparoscopy is not some always uh, changes the course of uh, infertility it helps in so many ways so uh, it should go in hand in hand so laparoscopy i think if given a chance if you're in doubt always do laparoscopy Okay. that is my opinion so so to summarize uh, as far as the tubal things are considered what i feel or what we gather from our uh, talk or our uh, discussion like when uh, the patient come down to us we evaluate her on day 2 we done her uh, scan on day 2 we found out that there is everything is normal ovaries are normal uterus is normal then we found out that the tubal assessment if the tubal assessment first is a non invasive that is hg all of uh, everywhere it is uh, available because she is just uh, uh, trying for two years not majority of the span has been there so it is better that we can evaluate by the hg or maybe a sonosulfingraphy if we are master in that and if the certain things is documented then laparoscopy is a is a tool to correct it but if there is only one uh, one tube is a spasm and the another tube is patent so we can give a try and then uh, after the trying also she is not considered then better we should know a peritoneal factor also what is the peritoneal factor which is responsible for infertility then laparoscopy plays a role so coming down to my second question for this patient she has normal ovarian reserve normal uh, semen analysis so what is the oral ovulogens you do what you will prefer any one of you yeah i'll take over it yes. yeah given the option between uh, the two most commonly used uh, ovulogens which i use between clomiphene and letrozole i would definitely prefer letrozole because definitely i would like to avoid the anti estrogenic effects of uh, clomiphene one second 
the residual effect which we see with clomiphene in the subsequent cycles, it is totally uh, gone. And letrozole having a short half-life, it has still better success rate with subsequent uh, cycles. Okay. Anyone else wants to add to it? My panelist can raise a hand so that I can uh, talk. Letrozole is known for a monofollicular uh, response. Yes, yes. Still better. Because uh, there are more multiple pregnancies with uh, ovulation induction and IUI than IVF. So, uh, letrozole would be better as far as a monofollicular. Okay. Uh, if she is not a, a case of PCOS, I'll not try for the letrozole. Letrozole is the first line of treatment in case of PCOD only. Uh, other cases means in normal ovulating patients or uh, if uh, she is a case of uh, unexplained infertility, clomiphene citrate will be the first, uh, first choice. So, uh, low dose. Okay. Yes, low dose. Okay. Hmm. So, so, so uh, like we all uh, now given her, uh, suppose so many, uh, clomiphene citrate, 50 milligram we had given her for five days. Hmm. How will uh, Dr. Sanjay, how you will call her to do a follicular monitoring or whether you do a follicular monitoring in her or you should not be doing it? You are not audible. That, that has to be. Dr. Sanjay, you are mute. Uh, you have to unmute the. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. In a first cycle, I will be doing, at least in a first cycle, we have to document that she is ovulating with whatever dose of clomiphene citrate you are giving. We have to do a scan on a day two or a day three of her cycle. It is very important to do, to rule out any follicular cyst of the previous cycle uh, uh, in this patient, because otherwise you will get confused. After doing that, you put her on a uh, clomiphene citrate and you have to call her after five days of her taking clomiphene citrate, maybe on day eight or uh, day 10, and look her for a, a development of follicle look for endometrial thickness also. If endometrial thickness is not good, not uh, it's uh, lagging behind, we can uh, add estradiol valerate if required. So you will add uh, estradiol valerate in a chlorophyll cycle? Yes, yes. If the endometrial thickness is less, I do. I will uh, add uh, estradiol valerate to this cycle as well and monitor her. Because sometimes in some patients are very sensitive to clomiphene citrate and their endometrial thickness really becomes very uh, hampered and it's not good in uh, clomiphene cycles. Okay. Uh, so can, uh, keep on following on day 8, then day 12 or day 13. And if the uh, follicle is uh, the of the size, then uh, you trigger. Dr. Sanjay, how do you assess the growth? Suppose she comes on day 10 and there is a 14 millimeter follicle. So how do you assess the growth of the follicle? For all uh, of us on day 14... I will call, call her directly on a day 14th. I will be calling on a day 8 also, day 14 also. And if on a day 14, her follicle growth is only 14 mm, then I may add again extended dose of, of uh, clomiphene citrate if she is on a clomiphene citrate and watch uh, till 8, 18. You can, and if still the follicle is not developing, then we'll abandon the cycle. And if the follicle has developed, then we can definitely give a trigger. Okay. Anyone else wants to? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll start with the clomiphene. Then uh, uh, it is to be given between second day to seventh day, any time, uh, uh, second day to fifth day, any time of a day. Means you can start on third day also, fourth day also, and fifth day also. That you can start. And then afterwards, uh, on the tenth day, we can call the patient for uh, sonography. If the follicular growth is 10 or more, then I'll not add anything. But if it is less, then we have to add some uh, gonadotrophins in that case. And if uh, the follicular growth is, say, 12, then uh, I'll call her after three to four days so that the follicle go growth, the follicle growth is two millimeter per day. So accordingly, in this era of uh, COVID, we should call uh, her as minimum time, as minimal time as she can. So we can call her after four days. By fourth, on the fourth day, she, her follicle should be around 18 millimeter, 
if it is there then it's well and good and then we can uh, give her a trigger in clomiphene citrate uh, cycle or uh, letrozole cycle we should give trigger if the follicle is more than 20 and if gonadotrophins are used solely so we'll, we'll then we should give okay okay, okay. okay. So hello hello yeah hmm. hello ashish ha hmm. ashish yes yes ha uh, see the patient is uh, primary infertility hmm. hello ha uh-huh. you are audible fine we have stimulated with clomiphene citrate Hmm. see if the patient is affordable and can be in- reinvestigated with an non invasive technique such as ultrasound as far as follicular study is concerned mm-hmm. and uh, then we can call her for a follow up if the patient is not able to come in this situation we can advise her the ovulation kit the specificity and sensitivity though it is not so specific but the sensitivity is still there Hmm. it will give us some line ki baba pre ovulation or ovulation we can guide the patient accordingly uh, and uh, ask her to keep planned relations first and simple thing if not possible then uh, second thing we can take a uh, cervical mucus st- uh, test is there and if not then go for an iui okay just just to just to have uh, some yeah. uh, things that need to uh, talk about you are yeah. given a clomiphene citrate and uh, as dr um, kadam has said you find out the out the uh, endometrium is thin so i wanted mm-hmm. to ask dr ranjit that endometrium is is a is a endometrium to be treated or it's a because of the effect of the clomiphene citrate what do you think sir well uh, i think that depends on uh, when what was the endometrium when we did the basic sonography when the patient came so if it was thin that time and again with clomiphene it is thin then clomiphene is not the reason there is some other reason true but it was better at, at on your initial basic uh, assessment and then it is because of clomiphene then yes that's a, uh, that's a indication to say clomiphene is playing up then it's better to move to letrozole true so uh, do you think sir uh, in a in a clomiphene citrate or maybe in a iui the endometrial thickness uh, you called as a thin endometrium because that is a something that uh, need to be addressed in a iui because all of us are knowing the thin endometrium when you talking about et or embryo transfer so that's because the embryos are been formed and then we are thinking of the implantation so here in iui we are just doing a, a semen process i uh, injecting into the uterine cavity the embryo will form and after 5 days it is going to get implanted so at the time of a trigger if you think the endometrium is thin really it is very some to you yes 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 i think i think thin endometrium is an independent factor what procedure you are doing because uh, uh, whether she is going to conceive naturally or with iui or with ivf the endometrium has to do its job what is it is supposed to do or designed to do so uh, is just not because you are dealing with a anovulatory cycle you should ignore endometrium mm-hmm. because if you don't have uh, and that's why if you if you have comparative studies between letrozole and uh, clomiphene the the clomiphene failure rate as is been described mm-hmm. that clomiphene failure rate is more and one of the reasons or attribution of uh, clomiphene failure is to the thin endometrium or the endometrial effect of clomiphene so yeah i think uh, we should not look at endometrium in iui cycles is not the right thing to do because uh, still that is one of the four factors uh, we okay. need yeah, yeah. so so to the dr yashwan can you yeah. just briefly uh, summarize what we talked about the role of the tvs from day 2 to uh, follicular monitoring and the endometrium what dr ranjit was talking about yeah when we do the basic scan see for any residual cyst see the endometrial thickness one and from day 10 day 11 you see the follicular size and the endometrial thickness as what dr pagul madam rightly said the follicle should grow at the rate of 2 mm per day suppose if she comes on monday with a follicular size of 10 mm then assuming a growth of 2 mm per day i'll call her after 3 days when the follicular size would be around about 16 mm and at the same time we'll uh, see the endometrium and it has to be anything more than 7.5 and 
And the main thing is the endometrium has to be a growing endometrium. It should not be a static endometrium. Along with the okay. follicular growth, the endometrium has to be growing. And when we correlate both these things, and when the follicle reaches the desired size, we can give a trigger and we can schedule whatever uh, we have planned, either it's a timed intercourse or a IUI. Okay, so Dr. Jogis, what do you mean uh, when you're looking at the endometrium? What actually things you looked for? Uh, at the first scan, day two scan, fine. That's a uterine part and that's an ovarian part. We have to see. Uterine part, there are a couple of things to be noted. Whether it is a blood, whether it is a tissue, whether it is emptying the cavity. Fine, the empty should the cavity should be clear on the first scan. Whether the what sort of characteristics it's flowing, it should be correlating with it. Okay. As far as ovaries are concerned, no residual cyst or uh, true. true. Uh, you are not audible. Not audible, huh? Hello. Okay. Uh, to Doctor Samir, if you are given a, a chlorophyll citrate. And uh, it means that when you call it, it's not working. When you uh, call that particular drug is not working. You're given the clinical cycle. And it means that uh, you, are, you are given it. And what response you uh, wish to have, it is not shown the response. So when you call it, it's a day that it is not working. See, when the growth, uh, rate of growth is not adequate. Or, what is uh, adequate means for all of us to understand? Uh, what do you think of adequate growth now? About the we have given 50 milligrams of clomiphene, and uh, maybe on day 10, uh, the follicle is not beyond uh, 12 millimeters. And uh, maybe a repeat can the uh, rate of growth is not not there. Maybe it's same or it's slow. And uh, on your repeat scans, if uh, there is no growth, uh, we might think of uh, increasing the dose in the in the uh, same cycle, cycle, you will increase or you will cancel the cycle? The next cycle. We'll cancel the cycle and then the next cycle. Okay. Anyone wish to have a difference of opinion because she don't want it to cancel her cycle? Yes, I'll add gonadotrophins. I'll add gonadotrophins in that case. Okay, madam. Hmm. Yeah, but she's not offering, madam. Then in that case? <laughs> then wait for uh, another seven days. Sometimes uh, in PCOS patient also, the follicle will start growing after 14 to 15 days also. Just to, just to answer that, there is called as a stair-step protocol. You give a chlorophyll citrate for 7 days, then you increase the dose in the same cycle. Because all of us are knowing the follicular phase is dynamic and it is not the steady phase. So you can, you can just give the same dose and if not showing the response, you can increase the dose of the chlorophyll citrate. The, it is given in a Gartner uh, uh, in, a, yeah. in, a, in any addition, you can give a stair step of protocol. So you can increase the that dose. Can be the, done. the same patient, if come down to you, when you call as a, she, she wants to get is a faster pregnancies. What, what she mean by it, she's a 28 years old, showing that previously she has been ovulated with the chlorophyll citrate to Dr. Yeshwan. She came down to you and she said that now I, in this cycle, you need to do something differently. So what is the difference in treatment in the patient? Like, uh, frankly speaking, I'm not a great user of clomiphene at first say. Second, yeah. I would, if she's not responding to clomiphene, I would add, definitely add a HMG to it. Okay. So what is your way of adding a HMG? Uh, the way we, uh, all cycles, we start with letrozole 2.5 milligram twice daily from day 3 to day 7. And from day 5, 7 and 9, we add HMG. And from day 10, we do the scan. And depending upon the response, we continue this HMG till the follicle reaches 18 millimeter. Okay. Anyone else that has a different uh, stimulation protocol for the gonadotropins? Because this is the alternative. Because nowadays in conference, they talk about when you talk, give a gonadotropin should be given a daily. Gonadotropins can be added in two ways. One is the sequential and co concurrent uh, protocol. Means in that case, uh, we can uh, start with the clomiphene or letrozole, then add a gonadotrophin the moment you stop the uh, clomiphene. Means if a uh, clomiphene cycle is between three to seven days, you can add on, after a, on the eighth day. 
eight, nine, ten, then then see for the follicle whether it is growing or not. Or you can start along with the clomiphene citrate gonadotropins till the follicle is uh, more than eighteen millimeter, and then give the trigger. Uh, second, third uh, protocol is you can start with the along with the clomiphene or letros on the third day of the cycle, and then again add gonadotropin on the eighth day of the cycle. In that case, you will get the num uh, more number of the follicles, but on the eighth day, you are adding gonadotropins. That is the uh, B. N. Chakravarti sir's protocol. On the eighth day, if you are adding again the gonadotropin, the maturity will be there. Okay, to Doctor Sanjay Kadam, uh, like if you are given a uh, gonadotropin, suppose for protocol, you had started with the letrozole and then you add a gonadotropin. In which subset of the patient you will think that there is a risk of premature LS surge? Just for all of us to understand how you categorically see me, okay, I wanted to monitor this patient frequently. In those patients, I will not monitor it frequently. Yes, yes, exactly. Those patients who are having uh, on a history menstrual cycle of uh, 21 days, less than 28, uh, 28 days, especially 28, 23 days, these are the patients who are uh, having a premature LH surge and they they have got a short follicular phase. especially these patients were to be very careful because they have premature luteinization and then uh, they over uh, luteinization prematurely and that cycle is wasted so in this subset of patient you should add the antagonist very judiciously looking at the size of the follicle if it is uh, crossed 14 15 mm immediately you can you should add antagonist because by adding antagonist almost this 30 to 40% of the patient this patients uh, Uh, cause premature luteinization and they the studies are there he, by adding antagonist almost there increase in the pregnancy rate almost by almost up to the 14% of so, so now now just to just to uh, rapid fire i'll ask one one questions for this uh, case then we'll go to the next case because i think at the time uh, i should be managing the first question is to dr samir what is your uh, ideal trigger drug trigger SCG ten thousand, SCG ten thousand. You will give. Okay, to Doctor Nalini, which patients you will give a luteal uh, support? Sorry. Which patients you will okay. give a luteal phase support? Uh, if the follicle, uh, if there is only one follicle, I will not give. If the clomiphene citrate is used, or if uh, there are more than two follicles, I will give a luteal phase support. Okay, to Doctor Sanjay Kadam, as uh, you uh, talked about antagonist. a uh, fixed dose or multiple dose no oh, it is uh, uh, not a fixed uh, fixed day protocol but uh, depending upon the size of the follicles if the follicle goes beyond 40 mm then add uh, antagonist okay to dr ranjit sir uh, what is the ideal size of the follicle you will see that the trigger i will give the difference in trigger means like a clomiphene cycle gonadotropin cycles or something natural cycle you are not audible sir about 18 to 20 mm yeah. okay to dr jogen uh, jogesh sir uh, like if you give a trigger whether you document the ovulation or you will not document the ovulation no 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 documentation of ovulation okay to dr okay. yashwan sir uh, whether you will do a single iui or double iui uh, i would prefer a double iui a pre uh, pre uh, ovulatory and one after documented ovulation what do you think of documented ovulation sir documented the follicle has been ruptured one or there may be some free fluid in the pod okay so uh, just to i'll go to the summarization of this later uh, at the end uh, we'll go going to the next case because of short of the time uh, the patient is 34 years of age she has given the history of irregular menstruation married for 5 years so, uh, uh, currently she has gained the weight because she is now 34 trying for 5 years put on a weight and uh, now she is complaining of the scanty menstruation her bmi is 36 there is a signs which examine the patient she uh, had seen the signs of hirsutism and androgenic hair pattern and her afc on uh, day 2 uh, what we done the scan is 20 we done the amh c is 7.8 amh so what is ideal i think i am audible Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, ideal way of going uh, ahead with this patient, with the doctor Samir. She is thirty-four years old. Uh, 
practical things. We like she's the current patient. We want a practical things. What we'll advise to the patient. Uh, she has already been investigated. She's a yeah. case of fever, and uh, I'll try to induce ovulation. But since she is uh, five years of marriage, thirty-four years of age, uh, maybe two or three cycles of uh, ovulation induction. At the most three cycles, and um, if she uh, conceives in the those three cycles, well and good. Or else, uh, I'll think of a hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, and be more invasive in that case. Okay, Doctor Nalini, Madam, uh, like whether you wanted to go with a uh, which uh, ovulation induction. oral or injectable she is a frank case of uh, pcod yeah. type a phenotype uh, she has a weight gain also uh, that is uh, 36 bmi madam you are not audible yeah. hello hello yeah. am i audible yes 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 means that that uh, there should be lifestyle changes so that her bmi will be reduced secondly uh, i will start with the letrozole because she is a case of pcod uh, one should start with the letrozole letrozole one cycle if the patient is ovulating well and good and if she is not then we can add gonadotrophin in that case but the first thing is uh, lifestyle management okay to dr uh, yashwan sir uh, she is ovulated uh, with the letrozole but she is not conceived now uh, she don't wanted to go for any invasive procedures so what is your line of treatment in that patient like considering her age 34 years and her bmi she is morbidly obese female and whatever treatment i advise her she is not going to reduce her weight so i would like to be yes. a bit more aggressive i would like to go in for ivf with a prezol and go for a transfer and finish yes. it <laughs> but she doesn't want to go Absolutely. for anyways you she will not go for ivf though because um, for her is now in a in a such a arthik mandi <laughs> sir that is serious <laughs> <laughs> she don't have money no serious are you only our lecture is respect to ivf how you convince the patient you have to convince the patient that this is the best possible option you have Absolutely. whatever medicine she is going to spend on laparoscopy or iui or any form of gonadotropin stimulation it may not work for her I because she is a she is a morbidly obese patient and the amount of money she spends like trying to save her a larger amount it will be in fact quite more than the money she spends on ivf cycle okay yeah. anyone differ uh, dr jogesh sir we have to go for an iui cycle hmm. fine we will stimulate her no she is ovulated with the letrozole but she is not conceived so what is our uh, uh, next um, what is called as um, armamentarium in your this thing to use for her weight she, loss she doesn't con no, no, no. It, weight loss <laughs> sir it is very difficult Long term. no 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 i know practically <laughs> Yeah, we have to go for, for a repeat IUI. Mm. If she doesn't, is not willing for an uh, IVF cycle. Yes, which protocol? Gonadotropin plus antagonist. With this column is, huh? Gonadotropin. Antagonist cycle. Okay, Doctor uh, Ranjit sir, if we have achieved uh, ovulation with letrozole, then I think we we should stick to that. We there is no need to increase stimulation uh, adding hmg again increases doesn't so but any better purpose but have a higher risk of ohss so going for iui with ovulation will be a better option because mm -hmm. she doesn't want to go for uh, any invasive procedures and uh, she is finding difficult to lose weight as well so we are caught in these two factors uh, so letrozole with iui will be the right choice uh to dr sanjay sir uh, like anything else is missing here do you think i need to investigate something endometrium she has it so i don't think i think uh, i a ts session prolactin 34 year old i don't know your voice is not clear i'm not getting yes such prolactin should be done uh, i think i think it had be, it, it must have been done yeah, 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 but yeah, i will i agree with uh, yashwan I agree with Yashwan because we don't want to waste too much time because she is 34 years. She is difficult for ovulation induction, 
uh, with the no, corona no, trophy no, because I'm about uh, anything uh, else is out. Out. do you think anything else is have you gone to the details of it because if she is not ovulated suppose with the uh, oral ovulation is not working it means that something is missing i started with the with the first like it is a letrozole there is also a studies of letrozole resistance yes you will add up anything else metformin we presume that other other three factors have been uh, evaluated yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. because you mentioned <laughs> in the in the case that she uh, later on complained of scanty menses yes mm. yes so we have to look the, at that as well m hirsutism hirsutism make it make it a uh, uh, more complicated there are uh, like like the doctor asked is also listening do you want this patient to undergo an lod laparoscopic ovarian drilling no 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 you are no, 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 no. 7.0 no. ams no. ashish yeah dr ashish the, yes um, this is the uh, universal consensus now laparoscopic ovarian drilling has to be absolutely uh, ruled out in yeah. every because you have got so good uh, gonadotropins available with good follicular monitoring studies because we have seen lot many patients who have had a laparoscopic drilling and after couple of months say six months or uh, later they come with low amh that's over enthusiastic laparoscopic drilling which is causing more harm than causing okay. any benefit to majority of the patients okay. so laparoscopic over end drilling has to be a uh, stop okay but but I, if at all uh, i wish to do <laughs> laparoscopic over end drilling i am old school thought of a person i wanted to do it what things i should be taken into precautions because see i done her uh, afc is 20 her amh is 7.2 so i have the reports and she is not ovulating so i i think i should do a ovarian drilling or not i don't mm-hmm. want it to go with the gonadotropin parvarta nahi hai mere ko okay whenever you want to do the drilling part yes sir as the name suggests drilling is going inside so you are supposed to reduce the volume of medulla and not the cortex cortex so i think that is the most important point because if you look at the histology of the ovary the cortex has the primordial follicles and medulla has the theca cells now what you want to do is tip the balance of fsh lh to normalcy from 1.2 or 1.1 is to 2 1 is to 3 to 1 is to 1 so you want to really disturb or destroy electrically or electrocorterially the medulla part so there are lot many videos which are painful to see when there are many <laughs> i know uh, many patients who have the ovarian cortex been burnt multiple time and it really looks like a golf ball with a lot of mm. black uh, barbecue it is like a barbecue over it Uh, and then then that's what happens what yashwant was saying that these people end up with from pco to egg donation you know that kind of, or egg recipient for that matter with a low amh so doing the ovarian drilling if we have to then we have to make sure that we are not looking at the cortex but at the medulla anything yeah. uh, like if i okay yashwant yeah just to add ranjit now the main aim of drilling is to burn the theca which is a androgen secreting tissue the main aim uh, what we uh, achieve want to achieve in drilling is to burn the hyperandrogenic theca so we try to convert the microandrogenic environment to a microestrogenic environment that is the main aim of our in drilling yes dr sanjay not not audible you have to unmute i'm not audible yeah yes i it uh, uh, i wanted to uh, because ranjit said we have to uh, burn only theca but it practically it is really difficult it is very easily said than done we cannot burn specifically theca inside even if you if you put your electrode long enough electrode inside because it will not burn it will burn theca as well as cortex also so what we can strategy we can have only we can limit the number of drillings that number should be less they are saying uh, uh, for for a uh, number 40 watts and for 40 seconds rule of second. four rule of four rule of four, of, rule of four. But, but that is that, that, is, old, that is that is the old school of thought sanjay sir because see ovary is big then four is big. like we are putting it very very differently 
So over is the, uh, yeah. yeah. What yeah. about depending upon the AMH level, you can moderate your number of drills. Now, if in this patient uh, AMH is seven point four, so it is a little higher. You can do little more drilling, not more than I suppose more than seven or eight in this patient. Okay. So so uh, now we come up with the with the patient. She has a given a clonopin saturate, and Yashwant is not a good fan of uh, clonopin saturate. We given a letrozole also. She is not responsive to the oral ovulation. Okay, so uh, so do you think there is a uh, uh, with this August gathering, there are the companies coming with the with the different molecular mixture and all melatonin, then uh, myonositol, then uh, decarbaminositol, oh, metformin. So do you think uh, that we are missing something here, Doctor uh, Nalini? To do the fasting and uh, uh, PP uh, glucose and the insulin level. If the insulin level is increased, then you should one should add the metformin. Otherwise, there is no role of metformin in that case. Then, then, madam, uh, like like uh, with the due respect to the pharma, they come up with the myonositol rather than better than the metformin. So, do you right. stick to the metformin or myonositol? See, uh, I am not a great fan of uh, both uh, metformin or uh, myonositol, but metformin indication is only in cases of uh, uh, she has a history of. Uh, Diabetes mellitus uh, GDM is there, then in that uh, uh, GDM in the previous cycle, or diabetes mellitus she is having, then in that case, one should add uh, um, metformin. And secondly, is the insulin resistance. If the fasting insulin level is more than 40, then one should add metformin in that case. So, Dr. Samir, Otherwise, there is no role. Dr. Samir, when you are started the metformin, whether you think the metformin will work for the pregnancy rates or whether uh, it should just uh, increase the ovulation rate? No, it will help with the pregnancies also. Okay. And, so uh, you start with the metformin and you continue the metformin till end of the delivery or do you stop it down? No, uh, I would like to continue with the pregnancy. Uh, to, uh, during the pregnancy. Why, what is the rationally behind continuation of the metformin uh, during the pregnancy? Anyone else can... Because these patients are high risk for a GDM and for GDM now, now they agree that uh, metformin can be used in a pregnant mothers also that can be continued and uh, till her glycemic index and uh, glucose is monitored very well, then uh, you can continue her uh, metformin throughout the pregnancy, even postpartum. Another also. Good, uh, good sign of the using a metformin is that whenever you are using a metformin pre-treatment also, it decreases the chances of OHSS. So that is the one of the thing that uh, if you started with the gonotropins, you should be uh, taken into account. So I think, uh, yes, Dr. Nalini? It's in IVF only, not in IUF, because we don't do, uh, we don't stimulate that much ovary yes. in that case. Uh, Dr. Shekhar, shall we take this question or will... Uh, what are... I think there are so many questions uh, uh, in participants. Okay, okay. So, so I think uh, if we are, uh, uh, we can answer that question, that will yes. be a... Good thing. If okay. somebody wants to say it from panelists, they want to uh, highlight okay. anything, what yes. is missing, then we can give a chance That's for yes. say, yes. three, four minutes. Yes, and doctor. then we can uh, sit down to question okay. and answer. Okay. Question from the party. Okay. 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 Ashish? Just, uh, to add one thing. Uh, all in clomiphene cycle. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, you are adding. Okay. Uh, if we, uh, when we are encountering a thin endometrium in a clomiphene cycle, this is basically because the receptors have been blocked. So, how much uh, estradiol valerate given from outside is going to help? Is uh, I, I, I was uh, Samir, I was coming down to that thing. That's why I asked in the middle what actually the opinions of all of us. Because when you are uh, doing with the clomiphene cycle, and that's why there is a protocol of a luteal phase uh, clomiphene cycle in PCOS. Because once you give a withdrawal and you start simultaneously with the clomiphene cytate, the by the time the follicles are recruited, your anti-estrogenic effect has been washed out. So okay. that is the one of the strategy for dealing a uh, in endometrium. And another strategy is like you have to wait. You have to wait for that cycle, how the endometrium is behaving. And still, what Dr. Ranjit has talked about, if the same is continued, even if after the clomiphene cytate in that cycle and she killed, that means there is a, a endometrium reason of thinning it. Adding a estrogen uh, to the clomiphene cytate per se for thin endometrium is, will not be a justifiable. 
Yes. As far as the thin endometrium is concerned, we have not touched upon the oral ovulogen such as tamoxifen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Uh, see, there is a called as a APT protocol. So I'm not going to that particular APT <laughs> protocol on tamoxifen. Uh, that is not the thing. But yes, the tamoxifen yeah. is, has a uh, this thing for Ad hmm. advantage in uh, poor endometrial responding patients. Yes, yes. The thin endometrium will occur only when the uh, clomiphene citrate is given repeatedly. Means in the first cycle, you will not get the thin endometrium if you start with the clomiphene citrate. But subsequently in the second or third cycle, if you uh, again start with the clomiphene citrate, then only thin endometrium will occur. If the thin endometrium is there, just wait the follicle to uh, become uh, uh, 18 to 20 millimeter and then only add estrogen. Because if you add estrogen before that, the follicle oh. will not grow. So you should right. add estrogen only when the follicle is more than 18 millimeter. Okay. Dr. Shekhar, we can take a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. And after question, uh, you briefly uh, narrate the audience because some people may have joined uh, later. Uh, protocols, what you have suggested, practical protocols for PCOA or unexplained infertility. In short, you summarize and then we'll conclude. Hmm? Okay? We'll yes. take question answers. Yeah. So, Guru, Dr. Gurunath is taking the questions. Yes, uh, just a moment. Read out Hello. The yeah. yeah, read out the questions. Yeah, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, the first question is after giving letrozole induction, if we get 24 to 30 mm size uh, follicle on day 9, should we give HCG trigger or not? Yes. Anyone can answer or shall I answer? Yes, yeah, you, you, you only can. answer now. You only answer now. Oh. See, uh, any, any follicle of 24 to 30, that means it is a cyst. See, if you go to the detailed definition of the cyst, is a 3 centimeter, is we call it as a cyst. So if you're thinking on day 9, it is 24 to 30, that means this is already a cyst what you are dealing with. So it is a, that in that case, you had not done the scan on day 2. You missed out something. So that's the one thing, that you have to do a day 2 scan and you have to adjust the dose. Because even if you give a trigger, there are hardly anything that's at 24 mm, you will get uh, the pregnant because it's a natural, even if in natural cycles, the later stage, what we uh, do a trigger is 22 mm. That is the last thing what we can give. No, I have given trigger uh, till 30 millimeter, but uh, and the pregnancies has happened. So, uh, till 20, 30 millimeter, you can very well give uh, trigger. Uh, a similar question, uh, if shape of follicle uh, is oval on day 9, uh, 16 uh, 12 by 12 millimeter, does it affect the success rate or any change in follow-up and trigger? No. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Sanjay, yeah. Yeah, we have to take the average of the follicle. If it is uh, uh, across, average of the follicle is more than 18 millimeter, then, then one can give a trigger. That is the criteria. It is not the uh, dimension which is uh, longitudinal. It is the always average. Okay. Uh, in unexplained uh, infertility, which one is preferred, clomiphene or letrozole? In unexplained no. recent uh, reviews, said that it is a clomiphene cited by the just in 2020 March. But there are the documents that uh, all the time the literature changes. So previously, if you go to the 2007 and all. The COH IUI was the preferred line of a treatment. But now, if you go only with the literature, the clomiphene cycle. I'm not okay. saying it's a, it's a mandatory because evidence changes with the years now. Right. So, you, if recent you wanted to know, it's a clomiphene cycle. Oh. Uh, Dr. Shashikant wants to ask what's the reason of CA endometrium in high doses of CC? Yeah, there, there are the evidences that uh, the CA endometrium has been documented. So, but it is not not in the in the particular way you can go uh, for uh, six months or continuously like that. It's a year to be. Okay, yes. because uh, uh, we know that CC causes uh, thin endometrium. So the question was why it causes mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. Then. 
no it is because of the uh, if clomiphene citrate is given in the pcos cycle in the pcos there is hyperestrogenism and uh, uh, it is there is a increase in the uh, endometrial thickness that is unopposed estrogen is there that will cause ca endometrium rather than clomiphene citrate oh. uh, dr shalini want to ask shall we wait after one cycle before Before starting, before starting another, after a couple of CC failures for washing the residual effects. Yeah, because all of us are knowing that the, there is a residual effect of the chlorophyll citrate. All of us are are known in our practice also. Once you start the chlorophyll citrate and you wait, the patient conceived. It is because of the residual effect of the chlorophyll citrate. So it is better to wait for certain times to wash out period of the chlorophyll citrate. Okay. Uh, is endometrial biopsy is must before hsg in un unexplained infertility with no history of pain abdomen and hsg why you wanted to do a endometrial biopsy but not required there is, there is nothing that why you wanted to do oh. because endometrial biopsy is again the invasive procedures so you wanted to do something that it is better to do a office hysteroscopy you see there is some lesion on see the signs of infection signs of corneal osteolytic agglutination as far as the tuberculosis is considered so it is better that one should do a, a office hysteroscopy rather than the, just a dnc or endometrial biopsy uh, dr anita want to ask should we use some adjuvant with cc or letrozole like ayurvedic uterotonics or something like that <laughs> yeah. not advisable <laughs> I, i really cannot do that <laughs> okay uh, then There are two uh, uh, yeah, yeah, participants I, who raised hand. Should I unmute them, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Gayatri? Yes, yes, you can. Okay. There are uh, five, six more questions as well. So okay. So once our participant finishes, we can take these questions as well. So by the time uh, the other participant asks the question, Dr. Gayatri is uh, unmuted. so she can ask question now you can dr gayatri please ask question we have unmuted you okay uh, there is a question from dr dr vikranti uh, sometimes we find a responsive endometrium at the fundus but remains thin in lower cavity what do you uh, suggest See, that is that is a typical of rat tail appearance <laughs> that is a typical of rat tail appearance all of us are gone through it this means that there is a enough of endometrial cavity is not been formed so it is always mm. better to do a hysteroscopic Histoscopic. assessment metroplastic cavity and it is better to you should know the volume endometrial volume rather mm -hmm. than just a rat tail appearance dr dineshwar want to ask role of pre treatment with ocpls And dexamethasone in PCOS with clinical hyper and uh, hyperandrogeny. I didn't get. I didn't get the question. Role of oral contraceptive pills and dexamethasone in PCOS with clinical hyperandrogeny. Okay, uh, Nalini, want to answer? Hmm. Yes. Uh, the yes, there is uh, some role of OCPs. Uh, you can give, but uh, there is no role of dexamethasone pre-treatment in the PCOS patient. Unless the uh, DHEAS is increased, di uh, hydro ethy uh, uh, it is epiandrosterone uh, sulfate. If it is increased, then only give uh, 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 dexamethasone. Uh, unless and until it is uh, positive, don't give. Uh, you can start with the OC pills. That is the age-old tradition that. Uh, for three months, uh, you give uh, OC pills and then start with the cycle. But patients are uh, so uh, they'll not wait for three months to, uh, to complete. Mm -hmm. They need the uh, need immediate cycle to continue. So you can start with the uh, directly with the uh, ovulations instead. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Pooja. If patient is not responding to letrozole. Is there any role of adding CC to the next cycle, or should we start with gonadotropin? Ah, uh, yeah. There is there is another novel protocol, CC with letrozole. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Sterility Fertility Journal, uh, maybe in 2017, they give a uh, clomiphene citrate with the letrozole. So thinking that both of them have a have a functional effect 
on the FSH window and FSH threshold to rise. So you can try with the CC with the letrozole if you don't want it to go with the gonadotropins. Mm -hmm. If you are accessible and you are confident enough to uh, do the monitoring and do all the stimulation, you can uh, start using a gonadotropin. There is no harm in you not using the gonadotropins. I don't think so. So you can definitely add a gonadotropins into that. Uh, Dr. Jyoti want to ask what is the dose and duration of estradiol with oral ovulogens? Yeah, Dr. Sanjay will uh, talk about it because he had uh, talked about uh, So I want him to answer. Yeah. Not audible. Yeah, not audible. Sanjay. Ah. Yes. In a first cycle, if I give her a letrozole or a clomiphene citrate, and uh, endometrium was not good with the experience of the first cycle. I usually add add uh, add uh, estradiol valerate on a day eight or day ten also. That does not do not inhibit the follicular growth because the mechanism of action is by inhibition of receptor by letrozole. So uh, there is increased secretion of FSH and LH by blocking the receptor. So by giving a estradiol valerate, it usually do not hamper the growth of the follicle. So if your experience is not good in the last cycle, that endometrium is not good with this oval uh, oral uh, ovulogens, then you can add depending upon the uh, thickness you are seeing on a, uh, a transvaginal ultrasound. If say on a day eight or a day eight, 10, you are just having an endometrium which is just four or five millimeter. Uh, and you can add estradiol virulate either 2 milligram TDS and depending upon the response, you can increase the dose as well. And when the follicle is 17-18 millimeter, then uh, trigger can be given. Or you, if you are, uh, if you are give, uh, inducing with the gonadotropin, then you can add this at earlier stage also, estradiol virulate. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Kalbuni, a patient uh, age 42 years, AMH 0.7 wants to conceive, ovulation is not occurring and she don't want to go for IVF. So what should, what protocol should we go? AMH is 0.7 and we really want to do IVF. <laughs> really That's the conception rate and pregnancy rate is really, I really up to the panelists. They will answer better than me. I really don't want to go for uh, pregnancy. Even with the IVF, also the pregnancy rate is not very, I, I, very good in this uh, low AMH patient. They should be offered only. Encourage her for adoption. Dr. Ranjit, sir. <laughs> no, I think uh, th this is uh, Prashant. Uh, we can look at this problem as a medi medical and a psychological problem. See, what you mentioned in your question is that lady with 0.7 AMH that indicates a very poor ovarian reserve, mm -hmm. which which has a very poor prognosis. So that's a medical side of the question. Then there is you also mentioned about the psychological side of the question <laughs> that the patient doesn't want to do any accept anything. Hmm. So what we are trying to do here is her inacceptance of any intervention, which is a psychological problem. We are trying to address that with some protocol, which is a medical side. So really, you cannot, uh, you know, you you cannot be on a two different planes. Hmm. So if it is a psychological problem, then we need to explain her, maybe counselor, give her options that you know the chances are very less, or she needs egg donation, or she needs probably adoption, or she might as well. Have a choice of uh, uh, living voluntarily childless. Uh, so uh, we have to answer the question in the same language uh, uh, which the question has been asked. So if we have a psychological issue, because medically it is very clear that uh, you know uh, uh, ovarian factor. Uh, so the uh, psychology, I would rather address her on the psychological grounds rather than the medical ground. I think, Ashish, that will be my stance. Yeah. Yeah, Ranjit, yeah. why people call you boss? <laughs> we come to know right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there is a next question. Uh, if, uh, uh, if endometrium Hola? is... Hello. Yeah. If endometrium is thin, but follicle uh, is 16 mm after letrozole induction, uh, should we add estrogen until when we can wait for trigger? We already yes. covered it, I think. Mm -hmm. Already we had discussed about 
because uh, the endometrium thin if you go uh, really by your uh, mean of doing iui they are documented the thin endometrium in iui less than 5.6 or less than 6 mm so any uh, endometrium more than 6 mm we cannot in a iui cycle i'm talking about iui cycle you should not name that as a thin endometrium so 7 mm with the letrozole i will not call it a per se a thin endometrium oh uh which which one you have to unmute hello yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, dr shobha yeah. want to ask which protocol is good for mild endometriosis with normal amh and wants to go for iui yes ashwin i just like to put on the uh, previous question which ranjit uh, ranjit very uh, nicely put it in the medical and the psychological part of uh, patients who are not willing for ivf with a low amh like many times we advise the patients like the only option you have is egg donation or adoption and we have seen a uh, few patients they have come with spontaneous pregnancy and at that time we are just faceless see in a medical science you never said no to anything i, I personally believe bachcha hoga kya hoga ho sakta hai you cannot say that bachcha nahi ho sakta you will so, never say in your life you can no, always no, say ho sakta hai so it is it is not no, i would i would like to add something here ashish yes is uh, you know now this this takes us to a very different uh, question the causes of low amh low energy we, we all have been uh, grilled and uh, made to believe that poor ovarian reserve is the single most reason for low amh but it is not there are okay. other reasons which are mainly immunological and inflammatory reasons which lower the amh if you correct them the amh will go up that's why amh on its own should not be taken you have to always have okay. antral score Uh, yes. With the AMH, you will also uh, like what Yashwan said that you have these patients and you sniff them some letrozole or clomiphene and they come back pregnant or they come back pregnant even naturally, and this is seen because AMH uh, is not just because of lower ovarian reserve but lower AMH is also it's because that. when there is increased TNF alpha, and which has got other reasons for that. True. So it is secondary to something, but these patients have. a good antral number or antral score so we can classify low amh with good antral score and low amh with poor antral score i think we should be talking about posidian criteria then not going to the details it's all about panel bits to stick to iu we will be here will be here till tomorrow morning <laughs> yes sir. yeah uh, the next question is uh, from dr ashwin uh, Will you please discuss few of routine and common mistake done by many gynecs, which you think is avoidable that you wish to describe today? Uh, All we are discussing. Uh, we will be just to summarize. We will be discussing that. No, no. Yeah. Take a take a take a one minute here, because see, I never said the gynec are are mistaken something. Never ever. All of us are learning. All of us are doing our practices. Best what we can have in a best. scenario what we are doing the practices mm. so the certain things which is missed out that doesn't mean that is not been taken care of mm. the availability of the resources should be taken into account so i never said the gynecologists are, are done something which is missed out never ever mm. so we cannot be uh, sitting out in this premises saying that certain things is missed out mm. so it's never like that it is the best of the things that whatever the uh, doctor has as doing or the gynecologist is doing is in their best capacity with the best resources available so i will not mention 1 2 3 or 4 something nothing okay. i think no uh, next doctor, next question yeah dr keshori want to ask what is the maximum number of iui cycle uh, will you go for before going uh, for other treatment modalities three cycles maximum three cycles after the three cycles the success rate drops down even if you go and repeating the cycle cycle I think one important point here to mention is uh, that it has to be uh, about three four cycles in the patient's lifetime, not the doctor's. <laughs> I wanted to uh, say one thing about uh, the what gyne routine gynecologist um, uh, uh, in improve. I feel the routine uh, gynecologist who those who are not doing IVF tend to use less of gonadotropins. 
to increase mm. the pregnancy rate i will advise all gynecologists to use the gonadotropin as a as a routine as a part of ovulation induction and iui because most of the gynecologists stick to the only the oral ovulations i, I mm. because most oh, of the time patients uh, all general practitioners give clomipin citrate and all other basic uh, even uh, scg and everything is given by the time patient come to the gynecologist i think all routine gynecologists should step ahead and start using gonadotropin routinely for ovulation induction and iui sanjay i agree with you and now i know why all pharma companies love you <laughs> okay so the next question is very interesting uh, uh, should we advise iui in unilateral tubectomy patients yeah the unilateral tube that's what why uh, we was discussing the one patent tube and one block tube you can take it into one tubectomy patient where the sulfonylectomy is done in a ectopic pregnancy and one is functioning tube or maybe a documented functioning tube mm -hmm. uh, by a laparoscopy or maybe a hysteroscopy ideally see uh, there is nothing called as a same ovary will ovulate in the same time we have alternate time uh, one uh, from the left side another cycle it will ovulate from the right side also by the jeffcott <laughs> theory i'll quote everything by science in the jeffcott theory there is a trans peritoneal uh, la, what is called as a uh, migration migration so it is doesn't mean that one tube is clamped or one tube is gone she is not conceived she will conceive even if from the other ovary she ovulate and she conceived also mm -hmm. so you never know you can give a fair chance of doing a iui or maybe a planned relationship for the for the patient i think a, a very good experience what most of us have see this theory of ipsilateral uh, transmission yeah. is true when we had uh, sketches that the tubes are perpendicular to uterine body you know like hanging say but if you put in a scope uh, and see then from the uterus you see the tubes curving out so the fimbrias are coming which in the pouch of douglas and ovaries are also fallen they are not at perpendicular to uterine body so ovaries are also fallen in the pouch and that's where the ovulation happens there are many a times we see corpus luteum on one side and ectopic on the other side so uh, sonography says that you know there are two masses uh, two hemorrhagic cysts or two complex bilateral areas ectopic. Bi bilateral ectopic or bilateral cyst or whatever and then we put in a scope and we see that there is a corpus luteum on right side for example that means she has ovulated from right side and in fact the pregnancy is then left tube so i, I think cancelling cycles uh, just because one side the tube is blocked and ovulating on that side is not correct we also see many patients coming back pregnant when we say ki okay you had a right side block you were ovulating on right side you don't get pregnant uh, this time so we stop the treatment patient says oh this month has gone anyway i have booked holiday for iui so i'll take my husband to lonawada and she comes back <laughs> okay. so the the last two questions i am taking now uh, dr ponam uh, want to ask uh, about what level of prolactin one should treat it and what dose should be given yeah i think uh, dr samir will be talking about it because uh, while our discussion we had uh, the prolactin uh, what he was mentioned you are not audible samir yeah any level which is close to 20 or beyond 20 should be treated and uh, uh, as the level goes up maybe uh, whether uh, the frequency of treatment will also go up but uh, in normal uh, infertility cases anything in and around 20 should be treated oh. and the last and question the level is and if the level is more than 100 one should get the mri done because uh, chances of microadenoma micro or macroadenoma of pituitary of pituitary is there okay. uh, the last question uh, dr kavya a stimulation protocol hmm. in patient with congenital adrenal hyperplasia hmm. if simple virilizing type With normal menstrual cycle, with normal AMH, FSH, LH, and semen parameters, with patent tubes. 
congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia yeah yeah it's basically uh, they want a stimulation protocol for congenital adrenal hyperplasia the rest everything is normal in congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia you will have a uh, no, levels of dhas which is on a higher side higher and yes, on a higher side so it is it is a better to give a uh, uh, in those उंटरवाइजे कुलकर्णी Um, nice yeah. to see you. Huh. I'm not seen you, so yeah. I thought uh, I should see you uh, before leaving this class. Yeah, yeah. I thank you, uh, Dr. Ashish Kale, for the excellent and informative lecture. Also for uh, solving all the qu queries and uh, all the panelists, Dr. Bagul Madam, Dr. Ranjit Sir, Dr. Sanjay Kadam, Dr. Mane, Dr. Samir Pawar, Dr. Yogesh Bachchao, and uh, Samarth Parma for sponsoring this meet. and thank you all the participants or the members who have attended the meeting thank you yeah from, from my side i am really thankful to all of you we had reached to the fss threshold of 230 and now we are coming down again to 12 so better than after one and a half hour we should uh, go back to our home things and do thank you on behalf of summer life centers i would like to thank uh, our esteemed panelists and speaker dr ashish kale and all the participants who have really spared their um, morning going into afternoon of sunday uh, it was a very very lively very engaging session and everybody has learned a lot i'm sure Uh, we will continue to engage digitally over the uh, course of time as we know that even not only with pharma but with your patients also now digital ways of uh, communication needs to be evolved yeah. and used by everybody so thank you very much for a very pleasant afternoon and um, we wish you all uh, safety please stay safe oh. and stay connected thank you very much okay thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, friend uh, yeah it's so, a pleasure thank you very much and uh, it's really a uh, energetic it's rocks always and now yes. among, i don't know how you people are managing but waiting to see you all in person yes yes yeah.